Okay, right now I want to talk about how to do fatigue design when we have a non-zero mean stress. So this is the case where the stresses are not fully reversed. Uh, there's a design process here on topic 4C, page 1. Uh, on Monday's lecture, we did, sorry, Wednesday's lecture, we did example 3 from the fatigue problems. It was a problem where we had to design a shaft, we had to find the diameter so that the shaft would have a certain fatigue life. Now with fatigue design, if you have a safety factor and if you have strength, then you can find out how much stress you can tolerate. Now in fatigue design, of course, stress is nominal stress multiplied by a stress concentration factor. The problem is if you don't know how big your part is to begin with, uh, then you can't compute the size factor. If you can't compute the size factor, then you can't get an exact estimate of your strength. If you don't know the part size, then you can't compute your stress concentration factor, which means you can't figure out your fatigue stress and your nominal stress. In that problem, or in, in a lot of problems where you have to figure out the size, we often have to guess a size factor and guess a stress concentration factor, solve for the diameter, and then update the size factor and the stress concentration factor, recalculate the diameter, and in one or two iterations you'll usually converge to a final answer. Uh, our safety factor for problems with fully reversed stress was simply Safety factor is fatigue strength or endurance limit divided by your alternating stress. Very simple. What happens if you have a mean stress? Here's a figure. We, we sort of looked at this figure briefly before. Um, it says here, recall from topic 3A, page 6. It should actually be topic 4A, page 6. Uh, if you have mean stress as well as alternating stress, there's several lines that can predict failure. First of all, if I draw a line from an alternating stress equal to the yield down to a mean stress equal to the yield, basically if I have an average stress that's at the yield strength and I apply any more alternating stress, my part's going to yield. If I don't have any mean stress but my alternating stress goes all the way up to the yield strength, then if I tack on any mean stress on top of that, my part's going to yield. So this dashed line, if you have a combination of alternating and mean stress that falls outside that line, your part will statically yield. It'll fail statically, not due to fatigue. Now in a fatigue sense, if I have no mid-range or mean stress, but I apply an alternating stress that goes from zero up to my endurance strength and back. If I tack on any mean stress on top of that, then I'm going to get fatigue failure. If on the other hand I apply a mean stress that's equal to the ultimate strength, if I put any alternating stress on top of that, my part's going to rupture. Okay. So usually you've got some alternating stress that's less than the endurance limit, some mid-range or mean stress that's less than the yield or ultimate strength, and your fatigue strength sort of varies between the two extremes. All right, there's a whole bunch of lines that people have tried to fit through experimental failure data. Uh, the most common one, the one we'll use, is called a modified Goodman line. It connects the endurance limit, or fatigue strength at 5 times 10 to the 8 cycles, it connects that in, that fatigue strength to the ultimate strength. And any combination of uh, sigma m and sigma a outside that line will assume failure occurs. Uh, there's a Gerber parabola, there's another ASME elliptical line uh, that may be more useful for failure prediction, but not as conservative as the Goodman line. And then there's the Soderberg line which goes from the endurance limit down to the yield strength. That one's a little bit overly conservative. So we're going to look for a safe zone, which means a combination of mean and alternating stress that falls 
inside the modified Goodman line. There are other lines. We'll just restrict ourselves to the modified Goodman line. Now, how do we find a safety factor? Well, one of the assumptions we're going to make is that we apply a certain alternating stress and a certain mean stress. And if our loading changes, we're going to assume that the alternating and mean stress maintain the same proportionality. So if our external loads cause, cause our mean stress to double, we'll assume that the alternating stress doubles as well. Therefore, any fluctuations in the load are going to move us along this load line. And the slope of that line is rise over run, which is sigma a over sigma m. When I hit the modified Goodman line, I'm at the maximum stress I can have before something breaks. Maximum stress before breakage is called strength. So the slope of this load line is also SA, the alternating strength, divided by SM, the mean strength, if you will. Okay, so we have a sigma A and a sigma M. If our load increases, we get to SA and SM. Those are the critical values of alternating and mean stress, beyond which failure occurs. Now, what's safety factor? Safety factor means how far are we inside the safe zone. All right, let's take a look at our modified Goodman line here. The equation of that line is, uh, let's see, SA over SE plus SM over SUT is equal to 1. Okay, so again, any point on that line is just about to fail, and that's the maximum alternating stress and the maximum mean stress. All right, let's say point O is at our origin. Let's say that we have a design point A, and this is our alternating stress, and this is our mean stress. So our load line, we go from zero up to here. Here's our design point. If we keep increasing the load, Eventually, our load line will cut the Goodman line. That'll be at point B. And at point B, we have SA over on the y-axis and SM over on the x-axis. All right, safety factor. The further A is away from B, the higher the safety factor. When A gets to B, safety factor is 1. So I can define the safety factor as follows. Safety factor for fatigue, NF. It's going to be the distance OB divided by the distance OA. If A is halfway to B, our safety factor is 2, and OB will be twice OA. So OB over OA, that's our safety factor. Now. If my safety factor is 2, that means I can double the alternating stress before I get to the critical SA. And it means I can double my mean stress before I get to the critical SM. So as a result, the critical mean stress is going to equal safety factor times my design stress. My critical alternating stress is going to be safety factor times alternating stress. And if I substitute these into the equation of the line there, I will get NF sigma A over the endurance limit plus NF times sigma M over the ultimate strength equals 1. And if I rearrange that, I will get, let's see, sigma A over SE plus sigma m over sut is 1 over nf. All I did there was divide both sides of the equation by nf. And now I can finally solve for the safety factor. nf is se sut over sigma a sut plus sigma m se. And that's it. Plug and chug.
Well, that comes from basically how far is your design point from the Goodman line. Now, uh, when you're increasing your load, you'll move out along your load line. And if you hit the Goodman line, then that means that fatigue is going to occur before yield. Now, there's another possibility. Here's that yield line, or the Langer line. The equation for that is SA over SY plus SM over SY equals 1. Suppose I start at point O, the origin. And let's say I have a... Uh, I want to draw this properly. Here's point C. I've got a high mean stress. And I've got a low alternating stress. My load line is going to be pretty flat here. And if I extend my load line, notice that I hit the yield line before I hit the Goodman line. That means that yield is going to be more of a problem if my load increases than is fatigue. So here at point D, I have intersected the yield line. This is going to be my SM. And that's going to be my SA. And now my safety factor, which is going to be a yield safety factor and not a fatigue safety factor. And it's going to be OD over OC. And through a similar manipulation to what I did above, I can substitute... Um, for SA, I can substitute N times sigma A. For SM, I can substitute safety factor times my mean stress. And I can rearrange that for the yield safety factor, which is SY over sigma A plus sigma M. All right, so I guess the thing is when you have a fatigue design problem, um, usually the load line will cut the Goodman line. So you can figure out your fatigue safety factor. But then you can always double check your yield safety factor. And if that one's lower, that means that your load line would actually cut the yield line first. So your safety factor then will be for static yield as opposed to fatigue yield or fatigue fracture. All right. Now, we're going to be taking different types of loading, axial, torsional, and uh, the other one, bending. If we have a combined stress state, we're going to have to find an equivalent or von Mises stress as we've done before. Oh, by the way, just a little uh, thing here. I'm going to flash up for a second. Look at that beauty, the old lunar rover. Back to work. All right, we know that um, if we have bending, we use a load factor of one. Um, if we have torsion, we can either use our full strength and use a load factor of 0.59, or if we use the distortion energy, usually we take our yield strength and multiply it by 0.577 to get a shear strength. Okay. Um, let's see. If we have axial loading, then we use a load factor of 0.85. So how do we lump all those things together and do fatigue design for a combined stress state? Well, suppose we have a simple stress state, kind of like the one that we saw when we designed the can crusher handle. We had a stress, a normal stress sigma in the x direction, and we had a shear stress. Okay, simple stress state. So we'll say we have a sigma x and we have a tau xy. This is what would happen if you had a shaft that was subjected to transverse loads. You'd have a sigma that was consisting of a, an MC over I bit, and then be, there'd be another sigma which was a P over A bit if you had a thrust bearing. So we've seen shafts before where there's been sigma due to bending and sigma due to axial. Tau is usually just from torsion. All right, here's the von Mises equation. Note the sigma prime for this simple stress state. So let's expand that out. Suppose we have an alternating stress and we want to find the alternating von Mises stress. 
Well, for sigma x, which we're going to square, we're going to have a bending component, which we multiply by our bending stress concentration factor. We're going to have an axial component of stress, which we multiply by our axial stress concentration factor. So you may need to use two different tables to get those two different stress concentration factors. We're going to divide our axial stresses, our pure axial stresses, by 0.85. So in that way, we're incorporating the axial loading load factor. OK, so all that's sigma x. We'll square that. Tau xy is going to be our torsional stress concentration factor times our alternating torsional shear stress. So we've substituted stress concentration times nominal stress into the von Mises. We get equation for sigma A. For sigma M, we get a very similar equation, except that we don't divide by 0.85 in the mean stress equation. I want to pause here and think about why that might be. Well, the reason is because it's the axial stress that opens and closes cracks. And the mean stress doesn't really contribute to that. So we only bump up our axial alternating stress and not the mean stress. OK, so there's sigma A prime and sigma M prime. If we have non-zero fluctuating stress, what we're going to do is we're going to find our alternating and mean von Mises stresses. And we're going to calculate our safety factor using the equations we derived on the previous page. And once we find the fatigue safety factor, we can check the yield safety factor. Or we can just basically add the mean and alternating stresses to get a maximum stress. And we can just see if that exceeds the, the yield strength. All right. If we have a more involved stress state, and we have sigma x, sigma y, and so on, then we're going to need to substitute into the sigma x, sigma y, and the tau xy parts of the von Mises equation. If we have an axial alternating normal stress in the y direction, we would divide that by 0.85. Any axial x normal stresses, we divide those by 0.85. So we can find the uh, sigma A prime and the sigma M prime for more complicated stress states if we need to. So finally, here is uh, an overview of this whole alternating and mean stress fatigue safety zone plot. Our Goodman line, which we've already discussed, is that one there. Here's our yield line. Um, it's tensile mean stresses that cause problems for fatigue life. If you have a compressive mean stress, that tends to have a net closing the cracks effect. Uh, theoretically, uh, if I have a compressive mean stress, I should be able to apply an alternating stress that's higher than the endurance limit. So if I apply an alternating stress that's higher than the endurance limit or the fatigue strength, uh, my compressive mean stress is going to have, is sort of going to lower that. But usually to be conservative, we assume that as our mean stress in tension goes to zero, we approach the state where we can apply our full alternating stress equal to the endurance limit. And if we go into compression, we still don't typically apply any alternating stresses that are higher than our strength. So we see this curve flattening out as it goes into the compressive zone. So the gray area is the safe area. The farther we're inside that safe area, the higher our safety factor, as we've derived. And uh, at this point, we are now ready to tackle some of the non-zero mean stress examples in the lecture problems handout. And that's what we'll do at the beginning of the next lecture after I field any questions about the material in this video. Thank you for watching.